All right, so let's start with the rhinoviruses. These belong to the family Picornaviridae. So they are a picornavirus. And there are a little more than a hundred different serotypes, meaning there are about a hundred different strains of um, rhinoviruses. So they have a naked icosahedral capsid. They're pretty small, which we can see over here. And they have a positive sense single-stranded RNA genome. So they belong to Baltimore class four. These are responsible for causing the common cold. So anytime you just have a cold and you feel a little bad and you don't go to the doctor and you get better on your own in a few days, you've had a rhinovirus most likely. <clears throat> These are limited to the upper respiratory tract. Um, and that's due to temperature. So these viruses do not replicate well at the warmer temperatures of the deeper lungs. So they replicate there in the upper respiratory tract where the temperature is actually a little bit cooler. They are highly infectious. So you only really need to inhale one virion, one single virus to become infected with a rhinovirus, which is why if you think about it, you know, even just like a month ago, half of you guys were all getting some sort of cold because you were sharing the same space. And there was probably a rhinovirus going around and everyone had a cough or a sniffle or sneeze. Uh, these are transmitted by aerosols. So anytime you cough or sneeze or expectorate when you're talking, um, and also by fomites. So aerosolized droplets that land on a desk and then you touch your desk and you wipe your nose or you touch your mouth and you um, get the virus on yourself. They can also be hand to hand, right? So people who cough into their hands, don't wash their hands and then shake hands with someone else. I've been saying for years, we should stop shaking hands with people. Um, but direct contact is the most common. So someone is breathing on you, coughing on you, sneezing on you or in your general direction and you inhale those particles. <clears throat> um, now we do get from the rhinoviruses uh, some partial or incomplete immunity. Um, so even though we don't get full coverage to each serotype we're infected with, we do get some immunity. And this is why we see that the number of colds a person experiences decreases with age. So you think about little kids, um, particularly in daycare, they always have some sort of cold or another, a cough, a sneeze, a runny nose. And as children age, you know, and start into elementary school, the number of those colds decreases. And now as a grown adult, you have less and less because you've built up a variety of partial and incomplete immunity so that you um, can deal with these coronaviruses more easily when you see them. <clears throat> Uh, unfortunately, like with a lot of viruses, there's no specific treatment. Uh, for the most part, that's okay for rhinoviruses. You guys all know you've had a cold, you feel bad for two, three days, and you get better. So even if there was a specific treatment, it might not even be one that's worth um, prescribing and spending the money on because you're going to recover on your own. Right, so rhinoviruses, there's a lot of that going around right now. <clears throat> A uh, respiratory virus that's a bigger deal that causes uh, more severe effects is respiratory syncytial virus. So you've probably heard of this particular virus. It belongs to the family uh, Paramyxoviridae, and it is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus. So it's Baltimore class 5. So here's a little diagram of our virus. Here it is with its helical capsid around its negative sense single-stranded RNA. It then does have an envelope surrounding the whole thing and a number of uh, glycoproteins coming outside of that envelope. So there's the attachment protein, there's a fusion protein that's going to allow membrane fusion. Um, <clears throat> and then um, the proteins inside that make up the helical capsid. So its name comes from its ability to form syncytia, both in vitro, so in cell culture in the lab, as well as in vivo during the body. 
So syncytia are a form of CPE where membranes of neighboring cells fuse together because they're expressing these fusion proteins from the virus. And as they fuse together, they make these giant multinucleated cells. So our arrow is pointing at one here and I'm kind of tracing it around. All of these pink spots within are nuclei and we can see this enormous huge cell here compared to say a single cell over here. Also, it infects the respiratory tract. It causes these huge syncytia, which gives us its name, respiratory syncytial virus. <clears throat> so again, um, this disease is limited to the respiratory tract. It doesn't really cause any other set of symptoms. And usually it's the upper respiratory tract um, that is involved. Occasionally it can be the lower respiratory tract, but like a lot of viruses, it's usually in the upper respiratory tract. Transmission for this one, again, fomites. So someone coughing or expectorating or sneezing on something, <clears throat> that then being touched. Uh, hands, right? So if you are a caregiver who has RSV, you can give it to a little baby by touching them from your hands. And of course, respiratory droplets. So um, expectoration, sneezing, coughing, uh, very wet, heavy exhaling or inhaling. One of the issues with RSV is nosocomial spread. So if you are taking a young child to the doctor's office and you're sitting in the waiting room with a parent or another child who has RSV, it can spread really easily there in the waiting room. So some people, some children actually pick it up in the waiting room while they're at the doctor's office for another problem. It can also spread uh, through hospitals, uh, through uh, NICUs, if people are not um, following uh, certain precautions. And it's thought that of anywhere between um, 65 to 98% of infants uh, in daycares will be infected with RSV by age three. My son had it at around two years of age, um, and he picked it up from his daycare. I think there were three reported cases in his small daycare class. Uh, at that time. So it's really common for it to spread around in daycares. Its clinical manifestation is mostly difficulty breathing, so labored breathing, um, along with cough uh, and sometimes wheezing. In more severe cases, this can cause very bad respiratory distress, like gasping for air, and in the worst cases, cyanosis. So the young child will look like they're starting to turn blue. Um, and that's particularly evident on um, the lips. So the lips will start to turn blue. So when my son had it, he had a really bad cough. He was coughing so hard that he would occasionally vomit and he was wheezing for breath. It was really, really terrible. It can be fatal in infants and in young children. So uh, particularly in preemies. So sometimes you'll see little babies in their stroller, in their car seat, and they'll have a tag hung on them that says, you know, preemie, please don't touch um, RSV risk, something like that, uh, because of the cyanosis that can occur and the decrease in blood oxygen levels. Um, in older children and in adults, if they acquire RSV, it may be asymptomatic, or generally just a mild cold. And these two things, an asymptomatic person or someone who has a mild cold they're not concerned about, can be uh, a problem when someone like this is a caregiver for uh, an infant or a toddler. If they unknowingly pass RSV on um, to that susceptible population. <clears throat> okay, um, we can diagnose RSV uh, through RT-PCR testing of a swab. This is the most reliable. It's not super fast, right? You have to send it out and you get results depending on where you are anywhere from 24 to three days later. Um, there is an antigen detection swab, so a sort of rapid test. Um, it is specific, but it's not that sensitive. So it can come back as a negative and a PCR test will be done. Um, just in case. Uh, like with most viruses, treatment, usually it's self-limited. 
Um, unfortunately, RSV can persist for about six weeks. My son was not sick for that long, um, but that's a very long time to watch a young child cough and have trouble breathing. But as you guys know, antivirals are not that common. And because antivirals are so super specific, there's not really a great one um, against RSV. <clears throat> In severe cases, where extra care is needed, it's just supportive care. So coughing dehydrates you. Um, and in babies who are coughing a lot, they can become dehydrated really easily. So hydration either through pushing extra bottles, um, it could be uh, intravenous if it's very, very severe. Um, in those really severe cases, a child may become hypoxic and you'll want to give oxygen by nasal cannula or a face mask or something like that. The best thing to do is to prevent. Um, RSV is highly contagious. Uh, it can spread very, very quickly. Those preemies are at the highest risk because they can develop um, other issues as well. So this little infographic that I pulled here um, is just kind of what we will tell uh, parents about um, RSV, about preventing RSV, about how uh, common it is. <clears throat> All right. Okay, measles virus. Everyone has heard of the measles. Like RSV, it also belongs to the family Paramyxoviridae. Um, this one belongs to the genus Morbillivirus. It is a negative sense single stranded RNA enveloped virus. It belongs to Baltimore class 5. And here we see its genome with its helical capsid and it is surrounded by uh, this envelope. It's kind of a weird, weird diagram. On the outside, it has two main proteins, hemagglutinin and the fusion envelope proteins, and it um, attaches to the cellular receptor CD46, which you've probably heard of. We, when we think of measles, we think about the rash, like the typical red rash that measles causes. But unlike, say, chickenpox, which can be spread uh, by touch, measles is spread through inhalation of droplets. Because it's spread by respiratory droplets, that's why it is so highly contagious. Um, it's the most contagious disease we know of today. The are not, if you know that term, the are not for measles virus is about 18. The are not for the current coronavirus outbreak, which is spreading really quickly, right? So the are not for COVID-19 is 2.5, if that tells you anything about how contagious measles is. Uh, here's an electron micrograph of it. You can see its envelope, it's pleomorphic like most enveloped viruses. And here on the outside are all its little hemagglutinin infusion protein spikes. Okay, so <clears throat> measles, <coughs> excuse me, has a relatively long incubation period. It can last anywhere from about 10 to 14 days. Okay, so in that time, the virus gets in, it begins replicating, and our first set of prodromal symptoms are uh, respiratory symptoms and the formation of these things called coplic spots, which I have a picture of it for you here uh, in, in a little bit. So there in the respiratory tract, syncytia are forming like we see with RSV, and this leads to <clears throat> necrosis and inflammation there in the respiratory tract. So it appears as like a mild cold, a little bit of difficulty breathing, um, but at this point, nothing that's super severe that you wouldn't think is normal for a young child. <clears throat> However, as this inflammation is occurring, we get the recruitment of T and B lymphocytes to the lungs. The virus then infects those cells and spreads from the lungs throughout the body. All right, so if we look at our time here in our prodromal phase, we have our respiratory symptoms, our coplic spots. <clears throat> Infectious virus is beginning to be present here. And then after a few days of that, the characteristic rash develops. So this is what we think of when we think of measles as the rash. So while these T and B lymphocytes are infected and the virus is spreading through the body, 
Uh, as we talked about with viral pathogenesis, measles results in the decrease of IL-12 production. So we have, <clears throat> we skew the um, antibody, we skew the immune response to not be more toward our CD8 cells, but be more antibody mediated. And because we don't having <clears throat> as good an immune response, our patients are susceptible susceptible to super infection with other viruses or with a variety of bacteria. Um, eventually, the antibody response will clear the virus. Uh, so it comes up nice and strong. We will clear the virus. Symptoms will desist after about seven days of that rash. Um, and our immune response to this is so strong that you develop lifelong immunity. All right, so a person who got measles as a child won't get it again as an adult. Um, <clears throat> so that is good. Unfortunately, uh, measles can be uh, fatal either immediately during the acute phase of disease or because that can um, result in this chronic uh, infection called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. All right, we often hear, and we heard this during the 2019 outbreak, people saying, oh, well, measles is just a mild childhood disease. Well, I don't really need to worry. Then my kid's gonna recover and be just fine, which is not the case. One in 20 children develop pneumonia due to measles infection. And this is the leading cause of uh, death due to measles infection, one in 20. That's a pretty high percentage for a mild childhood disease. One in 1,000 patients develop encephalitis. Measles encephalitis can lead to convulsions. It can leave the child permanently deaf, and it can result in mental disability to the children. I, I would not take that chance. One in 1,000, I'm not taking one in 1,000 chance. <clears throat> one to two in 1,000 patients die of measles, whether they develop these or not. Um, and then, of course, there's the potential for subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. This usually occurs years after initial infection, but it is a fatal disease. There is no treatment and no cure for it. Uh, and again, measles is really, really highly contagious. It's the most contagious disease that we know of. So if we just look at the number of cases per year, right? So back in 2000, there were no cases. Measles was considered eliminated from the United States. In 2010, we had 63 cases, we had a bump, we went back down. In 2014, we had 667 cases. <clears throat> and it seems like after that, people kind of got wary and the numbers went back down. But then in 2018, we had an outbreak. Um, and in 2019, and this, this data, if you look, this data was collected in March of 2019, we were at 387 cases. One month later, when the quote that started off this slide set was taken, April 24th, that number had jumped up to 694, I believe it was. So in, in a month, we saw a doubling of that in 2019. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, a lot of those cases were linked to people visiting Disney. Okay, so diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Of course, we all know the best prevention, but let's talk about diagnosis first. <clears throat> the symptoms of measles, if you know your patient is not vaccinated, the symptoms alone are diagnostic. <clears throat> One of the things, especially if it's early on, that you'll look for is what are called coplex spots. So these are white, you can see them, the one the arrows are pointed at are actually not that great. You can kind of see them behind them. There are these white dots surrounded by a red uh, ring on the oral mucosa, so on the inside of the cheek. So you see these coplic spots, those are indicative of measles. That, um, and they are sometimes concurrently, you'll have these coplic spots along with a rash. And for measles, the rash starts at the head and moves down the trunk, right? So with all these rashes, the place where they start, the place where they appear, uh, is a really differentiating sign. So this one starts at the head, moves down the trunk on the chest and on the back. <clears throat> uh, 
Along with those two things, our patient will also be experiencing cough, right? Because remember, it causes syncytia in the upper respiratory tract. They can have runny noses, they can have conjunctivitis, and generally a fever, okay? So taken together, these symptoms don't sound too bad, but when you consider the one in 20 chance of pneumonia and the one in 1,000 chance of severe complications like encephalitis, it's not a mild childhood disease. <clears throat> Okay, so if we can diagnose it based on symptoms, we can also do real-time PCR. Um, we can do serology to look for uh, antibodies against measles to confirm our diagnosis. So things are challenging with measles because there's not a treatment for it. There's no antiviral. So if you have a person, uh, a patient who is developing complications, we don't have a drug to get rid of the virus in the body. The only treatment we can offer is supportive. So providing um, fluids, if fluids are needed, uh, pain relief, um, things like that. And then if our person, if our patient is developing super infections, secondary infections like a bacterial pneumonia, um, we can treat those secondary infections, but there's nothing we can do to get rid of and to treat measles itself. Uh, you all know <clears throat> there is a vaccine. It is a live attenuated vaccine. It's part of the quadrivalent measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella uh, vaccine, the MMRV. It used to just be MMR. It's a really good, vac a really good vaccine. Um, Again, one of the issues with vaccines are timing. So this vaccine, the first dose is given somewhere between 12 and 15 months. So imagine um, those children who are younger than one year have not been vaccinated. And if they are exposed to uh, an older sibling who has measles, they themselves will likely um, are going to develop it. Uh, the vaccine's also safe in adults. So if you have an adult who has not received their MMRV vaccine, you can give it to them, it's fine. But you don't wanna give it to the immunocompromised patients and you don't wanna give it to pregnant women. Um, because it's live attenuated in immunocompetent people, it replicates a little bit, but it doesn't cause disease. And that replication is good. I believe you guys are talking about vaccines and immunology this week. That replication is good because it stimulates a really robust immune response. Um, but in the immunocompromised, they can't control replication of that attenuated vaccine, so it can actually have some issues there. Also, it's the same in pregnant women whose immune systems are um, are depressed somewhat, um, so it's not necessarily safe to give to them for those same reasons. It can't control um, replication of these attenuated viruses as well. 